All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the first session in our Planning for a Gnarly Future online learning series. Uh, we've titled this Reimagining Planning to Empower Your Community. My name is Jake Powell. I'm an extension specialist here at Utah State University, and I'm helping to uh, facilitate this training on behalf of our NAR core team. Um, for anyone who is new to the NAR initiative, NAR stands for Gateway and Natural Amenity Region, and our mission uh, here at the NAR, the NAR initiative is to help Western Gateway and natural many regions and the communities in them thrive and enhance the things that make them special. And we do this as a group through catalyzing and supporting research, education, and capacity building in our communities. So you can learn more about us if you want to visit our NAR initiative website um, here in the chat. You can also sign up for on that website to be part of our email list so you can stay up to date on the events and the resources that we're developing. So as I mentioned, this webinar is the first in our series. Um, we've affectionately titled it Planning for a Gnarly Future. Um, and I think if any of you uh, experienced the last couple of years, you're experiencing a gnarly future that I don't think any of us fully anticipated. Um, but we, at this time, we really want to thank our sponsors and partners who are making this webinar series possible. Um, the American Planning Association Utah chapter, which is providing AICP continuing ed education credits for this webinar. And, future sessions. Um, if you are interested in that and need a link for your credits, um, that'll be in the chat. Also, we're always looking for more sponsors and partners, um, in addition to these wonderful partners that are listed below on this slide. So if you're interested, please shoot us a note. Um, let, us, let us know if you're interested in donating to the larger um, NAR initiative. Um, if you're supportive of what we do, uh, there's a link to an opportunity to donate that will go directly into the uh, accounts here at the university that help support us. Um, this is the first session in a full training program. Um, if you're interested in more of the training series, please check out our website here in the chat um, to be part of the, uh, to, to register and be involved in more of these um, sessions. So today we're joined by two amazing uh, guests who will be helping us explore this topic and sharing their experience and wisdom. Um, Tom, da Tom Danzi from Springdale, Utah, and Troy Rust from Crested Butte, Colorado. And I'll let them introduce themselves here in a few minutes. So as an audience member, member a few things to note. Um, this session is recorded. Uh, we try to share these recordings along with the webinar summary, summary on our website after the event. Um, and then also throughout this webinar, we really hope that you'll engage. Um, we try to do these webinars a little bit different. We're gonna ask you some questions and we hope that you'll be involved. Um, so, First of all, to kind of give you some practice, um, we just want to know what your name is, uh, where you're from, and why you might be joining us today. So please take a second, open up your chat feature here in Zoom, and let us know um, who you are, where you're from, and why you're joining us today. I'll give you a second to do that. Well, while I'm talking, um, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have specific questions uh, for our panelists, there is a Q&A feature here in the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll address those questions if we have time. Um, so use Q&A to submit your questions in the chat feature to answer questions that I might ask. Um, also, just as a reminder, when you're using the chat feature, make sure it's set to go to everyone so just somebody here in the, in the room doesn't just get it alone. Awesome, it looks like there's some chats coming in in addition to the, all the links that we put in. Um, we got people from all over. It looks like a lot of folks from here in the Intermountain West, but a few people from um, Canada. Um, we got some folks from the Intermountain West as well. Some people from the South, which is wonderful. Um, it's great to see the the folks from across the nation really engaging in the NAR initiative. What we found is a lot of the lessons we're learning here in the West are lessons that people are also either trying to learn or struggling with uh, all across the United States. So welcome to our guests who are with us today. It's awesome to see so many names and, and amazing places and, and really um, similar challenges that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so I do wanna change gears for a minute and I want to, to, to ask your advice or um, get a little bit of information on your experience. To do that, we're gonna use a mentee um, inside of the, the chat here is a link to a mentee. Go ahead and click on that. I'm gonna switch my screen. Um, so everybody can start to see uh, some questions that we want to hear from all of you. So 
So you can go ahead and start to ans answer these questions that are being posted on the Menti and I'll move through um, these questions and share them here with you in just a second. So the first question we want you to ask or want you to answer is, did your last comprehensive or comp plan have what you would consider a vision statement included in the plan? Go ahead and, and, and answer those questions in the mentee poll. Looks like people are starting to answer. I'm gonna post that um, mentee again. So if you can click on this link I just posted in the chat and, um, and answer these questions, get, get engaged. I'll answer, I'm gonna ask three or four of these types of questions just to get a, a gauge of what the audience's experiences are with this. So lots of people, looks like the majority of folks are um, saying, yeah, of course, of course our complaint had a vision statement, right? A uh, few people, maybe it's been a while since you've looked at it and you can't remember, or maybe you weren't associated with that planning effort. It looks like the majority of people had some sort of what they would consider a vision statement included in their plan. So I'm gonna go to the next question. In your work, how often have you referred to your community's vision statement or maybe a value statement? Um, how often in your daily job do you refer to this? Do you do it like all the time? You know, every time there's a decision coming up or is it something that sits on the shelf and your community or yourself, if you don't talk about it very often? Yeah, go ahead and slide that slider bar, um, our, our uh, non-scientific Likert scale from rarely, if ever, to all the time it's critical somewhere in the middle there. Um, it look like there's a pretty good group of folks that feel like they're, you know, right in the middle. Maybe occasionally they talk about it, um, but it's not never, and it's not something that's pressing all the time. So I'm gonna to move to the next question. How often do you see your community's vision statement or values that you've, you've established um, as part of making community planning decisions in uh, city council meetings or uh, when you're reviewing um, development proposals, uh, making, making tough choices, how often is your vision statement really part of that decision-making process? Is it a core? You know, rarely, you don't ever really worry about it. It's something that is in the comp plan, but no one really actually knows what it says. Or is it something that like, all the time, you know, people are talking about this. Um, those values are all the time. It looks like we're we're trending real similar, kind of right in the middle. Either people are 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 uh, lukewarm about answering the question honestly, or you know, people use them occasionally, but not all the time. Okay, I'm go going to go to the last uh, second to last question. Um, when you did your community visioning exercise, um, and again, this is a very uh, official scale. On a, on a pain to joy scale, the, the pain being excruciating all the way to blissful, how would you rate your last visioning exercise that you, you did in your community? Liz and I developed the pain to joy scale. So if it seems, uh, um, might be a little confusing <laughs> in the chat, some pain. Um, it looks like people are, are in the middle. We started off with some strong opinions of it was excruciating, but some people are trending towards blissful on this one. That's great. Um, so the last one might take you just a minute. Um, I want you to, if you can, please share your community's vision statement. Okay. Um, if it's in your comp plan, um, if it's on your city website, like what is the thing that you're that you would consider your your vision vision statement or value statement. Yeah, this might take just a minute. And if it if I'm if I start talking um, and you're still looking for it and you can post it, that's totally great. Um, but you know, looking at some of these, uh, this one obviously in the Appalachian Trail, it's the center of outdoor recreation. We envision a community where businesses work together. It's in harmony with natural environment. Um, I don't know how would I find out. It's a great question. It's probably in your comprehensive planning document. Maybe it's on your website. 
Um, improve the quality of life while maintaining rural lifestyle. It's pretty simple. Um, so if you get a minute, try to add those in. We might go back to this just to talk about what what some of those mean or what they how they're enacted. Um, thank you for participating. I appreciate you everybody sharing a little bit. Um, there's a lot of oh, there's like some of these great ones that are popping up. Thank you in the in the chat. Um, but these vision statements are really interesting as we've looked at looked at them across um, across a lot of different communities here in the Intermountain West. You know, Carrie says we have several foundational documents, but maybe they don't all have the same vision. Maybe you see that in your community as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we came to the point where we are now. So, and I want to be clear about what our team's intentions are. This webinar and the webinars that are to follow are not what we consider an endpoint. You know, rather our hope is that these are the start. Let me share my screen here. So our hope is that this, this webinar is kind of our what. Um, it is us introducing and starting a conversation. And from that, we hope to find your feedback, ideas, and maybe a better understanding of your needs. And the, the ultimate goal of this is for our team to develop a training series that really goes into depth um, in a series of modules about all the things we're gonna talk about across this webinar series. And it's, it's really about the deep dive into the how. So our plan is to create a resource for NAR communities to begin to reimagine what we call planning um, into not so much an effort on establishing regulations and ordinances, but as a way to empower your community to engage in the act of creating a vibrant community. So if you or anyone you know might be interested in partnering with our team to provide support you know, in any way, shape or form to take what we're learning from these webinars and make them into a training series, please reach out to me or our, our coordinator, Liz. Um, here's our, I'm gonna throw our emails in the chat. If you have any ideas and you wanna talk, talk to any of us, please let us know. Um, so for us, just so you know, the NAR initiative is working across the Intermountain West. Um, so we get to talk with a lot of NAR communities that are experiencing challenges that are sometimes really unique, but more often than not, they're very similar to, to challenges we're hearing that communities across the Intermountain West are facing. You know, and, and our team as planners and designers by training, we, we, all, we feel that planning is an essential tool in helping NAR communities thrive. So as our communities begin engaging NAR communities across the region, we've, we've been really left wondering why, why isn't planning, um, as we learned it in school, not completely solving these challenges we see you all facing. And our, our team really has been scratching our heads and talking to many of you um, to figure out what and what needs to be improved. Um, this webinar has become the result of those conversations. And if you've noticed, each of the webinar, webinars we've, we've planned starts with this idea of re, uh, refocus, reframe, re-engage, redefine, reimagine. Those are the titles for all of our webinars. Um, and this is our start here in the NAR initiative to change the current paradigm of NAR community planning. The question our team is most often asked by a lot of communities is who's doing it right? Um, and our answer right now is no one is, and, and it really everybody is. I, I, I think everybody out there is doing the best they can with what they have. But I think here at the NAR Initiative, we believe that all of us can benefit from learning from the successes and mistakes of others. So our goal is to bring the best of what we're seeing across the NAR communities and share them with each of you. Um, however, many of the ideas we're seeing work are really refraining what, reframing what many of us consider governance or management and even planning. Um, so that today we're gonna start with the idea of refocusing as a way to preserve what really makes a NAR community special. So as we interact with communities and organizations invested in NAR communities, we're seeing a widening gulf between communities that establish and maintain a clear, simple vision of who they are and what makes their community special and what they value and then what they're committed to do as a community to protect what they, they see important and those communities that are not. We're really increasingly observing that if a community doesn't know and what makes their community special and what's critical to their character, and if they're not committed to preserving it, someone else will establish a new future while we're all busy doing the work we call planning. So now, I, I mean, it really identifying what makes communities special seems like maybe a divisive topic, 
Um, but we've seen across the, the region that there's a lot of understanding as to what this really consists of. So in this webinar, we're gonna talk about focusing on the path we wanna take rather than the trees we wanna avoid. So to do this, I wanna introduce um, five simple principles that are focused on being quick and nimble. Quick meaning they're meaningful but lean, and nimble meaning they're able to adapt to a wide range of needs. So those, those, those five Cs, um, we tried to make them interesting in, in all the same letters, or start with the same letter, but if you have any ideas, please let me know on, on better words. But the first one is commit. And that's really focusing on what makes, refocusing on what, what makes community special, um, takes a, a solid commitment from both the, the leaders, staff, and the community members to a new kind of what we call radical accountability. Um, and this is required before you even start the, pos the process. The second C is co-create. Um, our team has observed that all too often listening um, in, the, in the world of planning is, is sometimes about checking a box or verifying that our idea is acceptable. Um, this isn't enough when it comes to refocusing on values to create a vision. So what we're asking is for people to really start a dialogue, a conversation, um, and to, to start to, to have that conversation across communities. For, for us here at the NAR Initiative, we think a community encapsulates the people that live, work, depend on, take care of, and spend time in a NAR community. It's really a broad uh, idea of community. So we see this as an opportunity to, to re-engage your community, and we'll talk about that in the third webinar of the series. But some questions that might be probing, like what, what's special about your community? What do you, what do you cherish? What about your community is irreplaceable? Meaning like if it goes, what the soul of your community evaporates as well. And really focusing on less is better. Focus on what people can really agree on and get behind um, rather than all of the, the tangential things that come out sometimes in those processes. So the third is clarify. And what I mean by that is, what do these values really mean to your community? How are you gonna decide on, how are you gonna know um, whether the community is or is not heading in the right direction when these values are adopted. So working with the community to decide how to make your values vision, values and vision measurable and actionable. So one way we've seen this work really well is transitioning statements into, into sentences that start with we will or this means. Um, so for some of you who already have a vision statement that you talked about in our, in our, in our survey, um, this might be a great place to start is understanding how to clarify and operationalize your vision statement. The other C is cat catalyze, meaning um, keeping your vision front and center in, in all that you do. If, you're, if your community is committed, um, it's an opportunity to take what you co-created and make it a measuring stick. And by a measuring stick, that measuring stick goes both ways. It goes to the governing structures, ideas, and actions to be accountable, and also the community, the community of people to be held accountable to how their ideas and actions measure up. So if you already have a vision statement, this is another good way to try to find, to make your, your vision statement a North Star that guides your decisions. And the last one is cycle. And that is really doing this over and over again. Obviously, this is not um, a once and done. It's on a reasonable interval. You'll need to check to see if your community's changed. And if it has, you need to revise it or change it. So this cycle of listening, adapting, and listening again, is something we, we see across the region as a helpful way to make values as vision important. So these five C's are hopefully just a simple framework to get you started. Um, we've invited a couple of guests, as I mentioned, to, to talk about their experiences creating values or vision-based planning um, in some of the most, what I would consider iconic NAR communities in the West. So I wanna welcome Tom Danzi, the Director of Community Development, um, uh, for the town of Springdale and Troy Russ, Community Development Director for Crescent View, Colorado. So I wanna allow Tom and Russ to maybe introduce themselves briefly, then I'll be asking them a series of questions to get their insights into how this value or vision-based approach has worked in their community. So Tom, if you could introduce yourself real quick and then I'll turn the time over to Russ. Thank you, Jake. Uh, my name is Tom Dancy. Um, I am a lifelong visitor and enjoyer of NAR communities, and for the past 18 years, I've had the honor and privilege of working as the Director of Community Development in Springdale, Utah, which is adjacent to the 
south entrance of Zion National Park. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. Russ. Um, my name is Troy Russ. I'm the Community Development Director of Crested Butte, Colorado. Uh, we're here at the end of the road. Um, I've been lucky to be here for three years after a 35-year uh, career in both the public and private sectors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Troy. So we're going to do the format a little differently. I'm going to ask these, these uh, uh, guests some questions and maybe some follow-up questions. And if these questions spur ideas for you, again, use the Q&A feature um, to, to put your questions in and we'll try to get to them if we have time. So first question is for you, Tom. Um, how has Springdale implemented their vision and values so they can be used on a daily basis in guiding their community development? Um, yeah, so, so the, the town has been operating under kind of the same vision framework for a long, long time. Our first uh, general plan that, that established our current vision framework was dates all the way back to 1992. And that, that vision that was established then talks a lot about what we refer to as village character, or village scale, village atmosphere. And those are kind of um, random or not random, but they're, they're kind of ambiguous terms, but we, we define them as referring to our location in, in Zion Canyon, our relationship to Zion National Park, the, the modest scale of development in the town, um, and the need to preserve a residential character in the community and, and avoid over-commercialization. Those, those concepts and those terms, like I said, have, have been so ingrained in the land use ethos of the town for the past 30 years that they're really now kind of second nature. And, and when we use those terms, village character, village atmosphere, people understand what we're talking about and people, people know what those terms mean. And so they've become so operationalized in our land use and our planning. Um, that really they inform and guide all of the decisions that we make and, and how we go about doing our planning. And the reason that's that's been successful is just because we've been consistent with that vision for, for 30 years and it's become so ingrained in the community. So maybe a quick follow-up to that, Tom. Can you share an example, um, you know, maybe in the recent class, I know things like uh, nightly rental, things like that, that, that have been maybe recent technologies that weren't even envisioned in 1999. How have you used your vision or, or that, that kind of core to, to help guide when, when these questions have come about that the people in the 90s couldn't even imagine? Yeah, great question. So um, with, with specific reference to like nightly, rent, nightly rentals, um, with the proliferation of, of nightly rentals and the advent of, of the travel tech industry and Airbnb, um, our community quickly recognized that as a threat to what, what we vision as our village character or, or our village atmosphere. And um, re recognizing the, the, the way things were developing in the town um, with regard to lodging was, was a, a deviation from where we wanted to go with our vision. Um, our council uh, took, took steps to um, actually enact a, a moratorium on transient lodging which gave us the time to um, rewrite our ordinances and, and adopt a new regulation regarding nightly rentals and transient lodging. Um, in, in Utah, if you do a, a moratorium, you only get six months. That's the maximum length of a, of, a land, of a temporary land use regulation in Utah. Because we had that vision already established and because we already had the framework of what we wanted our community to be, it really helped us get our new lodging regulations adopted and in place in that short six month period much more efficiently than we would um, if we did not have that vision already in place. Great, thanks. So Troy, I wanna turn the time over to you um, or put a question in front of you. So um, Crested Butte has, has been through a, a, a pretty, pro I guess, progressive or different planning um, process to in the last little while. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and why your community decided to use what I would consider a value-based planning effort instead of you know, maybe a traditional vision-based planning effort. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we just finished an 18-month process called the Community Compass to create our North Star. Um, and it was very intentional in its creation not to create a vision, uh, but to explain who we are, what the challenges are before us and how we're gonna tackle them together. And so in defining who we are, we agreed that we're a community. Um, 
And that community is represented by all of those who embrace the, embrace the special nature of Crested Butte. So those are the primary residents, the second homeowners, the visitors, uh, the employees, anyone who embraces Crested Butte, this document represents them. So we did a, uh, in our outreach, uh, we're a community of 1600 people in a valley of about 8,000. And we had 1600 people participate in the survey uh, and in the process. So we had extensive outreach, community meetings, conversations, focus groups. And the reason we went with a value-based um, comp plan is we've seen our values run into each other and our community be paralyzed. And so when you see affordable housing and environmental protection or community character and historic preservation, they run right into each other. And there isn't an answer to which either side is going to be happy with. Uh, and affordable housing and historic preservation is a classic conflict. Uh, ranching and bicycling, mountain biking and recreational access, they're running into each other at great risk to this valley. And so we wanted to create what we call a decision-making framework. How, when our values start to run into each other, can we make a decision together um, and move forward instead of be paralyzed? And this community is a wonderful place. And I think the fact that we've been paralyzed for 12 years or more uh, is one of the reasons Crested Butte is cool. So uh, being paralyzed and not having a plan does have its benefits. Uh, but we started to see now with money finally hitting Crested Butte and seeing the inequity and the level of investments coming here without those value-based decisions, uh, we could see the valley very quickly get out of control. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we decided not to create a vision because we couldn't agree to one. Mm -hmm. And it's really, what do we value? What are the challenges? And if you look at our document, how are we going to do this? So I think it's the most important thing about our compass is it's really a contract between the town and everyone who takes and embraces the special nature of this place. And, and together we can figure it out. So Great. it doesn't have an answer, it has a process. Like, yeah. a, good, like a good planning document, right? That's really interesting, uh, that, that, that idea of, of uh, rather than a, a vision, it's looking at a process. And I, you mentioned the valley, Troy, and, and maybe I'll, this is for both of you, but I'll start with you, um, you know, both, your Springdale's general plan and, and the community compass there in Crescent, you talk about um, regional partnerships and, and use and utilizing or working with the region. Um, I, I'm curious, wh why do you think working re regionally is important to help your community implement its community objectives that are laid out in, in these documents? And I'll, I'll go with you, Troy, Troy and then Tom. Um, the, the, the challenge is facing the town are beyond the ability for the town to resolve by itself. So when we talk about affordable housing in the Valley, while we have most of the employment, uh, we certainly being a, a community of 10 by 10 blocks, don't have all the answers within those 10 by 10 blocks or transportation or some of the environmental concerns are regional by nature. And Crested Butte in the past in Gunnison County have been acting unilaterally and not necessarily collaboratively. We've been good at coordinating, but not really good at collaboration. And we wanted the compass to be sort of a declaration that the town is growing up and we're going to be a partner in the region. And so that's why we need the region and we're making a commitment to be a regional partner. Yeah, I, I, before you answer that question, Tom, I, I noticed Liz put in the uh, in the chat links to both the the Springville uh, plan and the community compass there in Crested Butte, and there is some interesting language in there about what the town of Crested Butte is committed to regionally, which I think is an interesting step. It's not actually um, requiring the the region to react, but it's it's committing itself to the region, which I think and is and, and just to add to that, the Crested Butte is committing to spending money outside of our boundaries. Mm which is rare for most cities. Yeah. So Tom, that same question, um, how do you think working we, working regionally is important when it comes to Spring, Springdale um, implementing their objectives? Uh, yeah, well, as, as, you know, as, as Troy mentioned and alluded to, one of the uh, kind of hallmarks of a, of a NAR community is being part of a broader landscape or a broader region. Um, and that broader region 
influences and impacts what happens in the municipality or in the town. And likewise, what happens in the town can influence or impact what happens in that broader region. So it's really, for all the reasons that Troy mentioned, it's, it's imperative to work regionally to address these transportation, environmental, housing issues. Um, one of the things that, that we've been really happy with in Springdale and, and actually in the region is our efforts in a group called the Zion Regional Collaborative, um, which is a, a regional group of uh, local jurisdictions, federal land management agencies, state agencies, and other interested stakeholders in the region that's really been set up to address these regional issues. Um, and you know, as, as Troy mentioned, that in Crested Butte, they, they're willing to expand resources outside their, their boundaries, which is fantastic. Similar, the, similarly, the ZRC and the, and the partners in the ZRC recognize the need to um, expand resources and, and participate and collaborate outside our boundaries for, to, to solve these really tricky, gnarly regional issues. Tom, I appreciate you use the word gnarly. That was awesome. Um, a, kind of a follow-up or sub-question that for you, Tom. Um, when it comes to working at that Zion Regional Collaborative regional scale, how has the town's effort to use your vision or that, that long-standing vision that was created, how has that helped you in the region? Or, or maybe what are some of the challenges? Have you, have you had uh, issues where you kind of butt up against other visions or other ideas where your vision has had to come in question or you've had to stand on it in some sort of way? And what did that look like? Yeah, so 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 you're you're asking specifically in in the context of regional collaboration. Yeah, um, so great question. Um, and in we we make it very clear in the Zion Regional Collaborative that we are there to collaborate. We're not we're we're not there to impose anyone's vision on on anyone else. And we recognize that different communities. Um, have different priorities and different values, um, different agencies, state or federal agencies have different mandates um, and, and different, different limitations on what they can and can't do. Um, and so we recognize that there's some naturally some inherent conflict between the visions of the different partners in this regional collaboration. However, that doesn't mean that's, that's not a, a, a um, bar on collaboration. So what we're, what we're speaking to do with collaboration is to work together to better understand each other's values and priorities and collaborate together to help each of the individual members of the ZRC or the Zion Regional Collaborative achieve those values and priorities. I would assume that having those laid out in a document helps, you know, those, those values and vision being stated from the get-go when it comes to collaborating helps everybody start from a common place, which I think is, is interesting when you step regionally beyond your borders. So. Um, so this one's for Troy. So in, in your community compass um, document, there's, there's this chapter, and I think at least the draft was chapter three, and they, you call it a, um, this framework section. So I, I'm curious if, if this is sort of a two-part question, how has the process of developing what you call the community compass impacted your community? And then the second piece of that community why is that chapter three, that framework section, so shocking to a lot of planners that are that are not used to seeing something like that in in a planning document? Could you talk to the logic behind that? Yeah, um, the community compass uh, has been widely embraced. Uh, we were fortunate that a award-winning documentary was done on Crested Butte called High Country, and that sort of documented the history of the town, tied in all the town founders and the history and told the story of Crested Butte up until Vale bought the mountain. And it literally, we started the community compass right as that document and movie was being released. And it tied the two together. And so we have the old timers, the new timers, the, the, the second homeowners all participate in compass, understanding the challenge and to have an award-winning documentary done at the exact same time certainly helped. And so there's a lot of expectations. Uh, and it's interesting, the expectation is now we know the compass didn't have an answer, but the town is making a commitment to whatever decisions we make is gonna follow the decision framework that's in chapter three. Um, and it's interesting, we had the luxury of, we put two moratoriums up in the town while the compass was going on. Uh, one of them was our short-term rentals. Uh, and we, unlike Utah can cape a moratorium, 
uh, going. We kept it a year and a half while Compass was on. When our or and so we used an example in the draft Compass, I think that Elizabeth shared, uh, describes how we're going to tackle um, the short-term rentals through the Compass process. The final draft, um, it's now taken out of that chapter because we're about to adopt a new ordinance. And so what happened in 2016 when we first drafted, this is the example, when we first drafted our vacation rental ordinance, it took nine months to get it drafted. Uh, when we followed the compass process, it took us two. And it's much more aggressive. Uh, and we credit the compass. Uh, we didn't come in with an answer. We came in, what is the challenge? What is the outreach that we're going to do to address that challenge? And who has to be included in the conversation? What are, once we include them, what are agreed to success measures? From those success measures, we actually drafted the alternatives. And now that draft is in front of council. And so it, the shocking piece, or it's shocking is not the right word, it's, it's actually, I think, a pleasant surprise by most people that everyone talks about civil, civility and community trust, and they expect people to speak well to staff or council, but never do you see in those civility documents that the town is making a promise back. And the compass is the promise back that we're not going to make a decision without you. And we, we're going to make sure the people who are involved are well aware of the situation before we make that commitment. So that's the interesting part of compass. Um, I've been a part of this planning for a long time, and I've never seen a document that sort of commits a town to an outreach effort on every subject matter. Um, and so we are afraid not to try to create a future land use map, which is the common exercise in a comprehensive plan, we intentionally didn't do that. It's in our strategic plan saying we're going to do it, but we say this is how we're going to do it when we tackle it together. So that's the interesting part of Compass. Yeah, thank you. So on that note, um, and I guess I, just to be transparent, um, we're not, and I don't think either either Tom or, or Troy are saying this is the one way of doing things. These are sort of two different approaches or two two ways that are values or, or, or vision-based planning, which is kind of what we're trying to highlight here. Um, but Tom, you know, Springdale's been doing this, um, had this vision to guide their general planning and, and the subsequent iterations for quite a long time. So I'm curious, um, what aspects of having this vision-centric plan have worked well in your community? And then, you know, full transparency, what aspects have encountered challenges? What, what's not the rosy part that you wanna share with some folks? Yeah, so the the advantage or, or the benefits of having a, this this well defined and, and supported vision is that it really helps the community um, uh, buy into the land use planning process, be invested in the process, and and really participate in the process. And um, you know, Troy mentioned the the importance of involving the community in in in, in the decision making process and. Are having having this well established vision um, really really I think helps facilitate that in Springdale. It's it's been a great opportunity for the town, for the community members to to be committed and to be engaged and participating in the land use process and to to really um, demonstrate their care and commitment for the community. So it's been in that regard, it's it's fantastic and and it, and it helps facilitate that. Um, one of the along the along those same lines, though, one of the one of the problems that that we sometimes encounter is um, uh, comes down to to the difference between an administrative action and a legislative action. Um, our our vision is fantastic in helping inform legislative decisions, policy decisions. Um, you know what 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 ordinances should we adopt? What what strategies? What plans should we adopt? Um, what about rezonings? Those are all all the all the kinds of legislative decisions that this vision really really helps inform. Um, then there's a whole host of other uh, land use decisions which are administrative decisions, and those are just implementing the policies that you've already established. Um, and you know what? Gosh, sometimes there are, are projects that come along that, no matter how hard we try, don't fit within our vision, and they're administrative in nature and is obligated to approve or, or, or to allow those, those projects or, or, or those, those, uh, those developments to, to proceed. The difficulty we have with, with the community being so bought into the vision is that then the community is like, hey, what gives? 
that's not part of our vision. That we that that doesn't that's not village scale. Um, and so one of the difficulties we have is is you know just trying to help the community understand when it's appropriate for the town to use that vision and what kinds of actions and what kind of decisions that vision is really intended to inform. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That's I, I appreciate sort of the honesty of, of where the limits are that you found thus far. Um, I want to end with one last question. I'm going to call an audible here um, because I, Ray here in the audience asked a really great question that points at engagement. And I, know I do want to, again, plug, we're going to do a whole webinar on, on, a, on community engagement, sort of a new way of thinking about community engagement and have a conversation about that. But um, and, and maybe Troy, um, you can talk a little bit about this and, and Tom as well. But um, Ray says, you know, engage, what engagement tools have you found to be most effective? And, and you don't need to go into the nitty gritty. Maybe there's something you can refer Ray to that can help him, you know, see some of these tools that you've done. I know, Troy, um, your document talks a lot about the engagement. But he, you know, Ray, Ray points out what many people are thinking. They're, they can be really expensive. And so, you know, their, their community is a little hesitant about providing a form for all populations in the community. Um, you know, that, that, that can be a challenge uh, to engage them appropriately and, and rigorously. So uh, any thoughts on that? I know that's a, that's a really big topic. And like I say, we have a full webinar um, coming up in a few months that'll cover that. Um, but any, any sort of tips that you've learned, Troy or Tom, on engagement? Troy, I'll, I'll let you go first. Um, uh... I don't know if people are going to like this answer. There isn't a technology that's going to get everybody. I think the expense is um, willpower of the staff and commitment of the staff. So as we reached out to 1,600 people, yeah, we had a survey monkey. Uh, wow, that's $500 for a year, right? I think it was the community development department's commitment to be outside. We spent my young, I sent my younger staff to happy hours at the bar. We went to employee meetings at the stash and had it, the, the employers would let us speak at the employee meetings. We put posters up and fill in the blanks at our transit stops. We were relentless. We set up in front of our post office, you know, Crested Beach post office. We have long lines and terrible service. So we got a lot of feedback. We went in front of our grocery store. So I think the answer to get that and to, and then the trust built on itself. It started to snowball. Um, and we went up to the mountain and sat at the lift. We went down to CB South, we went down to Gunnison and sat in front of the grocery store. So it really is a commitment of time and a commitment of perseverance and being accessible. I think I had plus a hundred coffee talks with people in town and you'd ask one person to say, who do we need to talk to? And I think it's just a staff's commitment. Now that, Ray, is very expensive because your staff has other work to do, but it's that commitment to do it. We did not hire a consultant to do it. Mel Yama and I and my and Jenna just were relentless on going out. And one other thing, the easiest thing you can do is we put a banner across Main Street. And whenever we had an important public meeting, we put the banner up, Community Compass tonight, and we put it or and put the date and so it's really simple technologies, but it's more about being committed. Thanks, Troy. Any, anything you want to add to that, Tom, that I guess you found to be successful? Um, just, you know, I, I agree with everything that Troy has said. Um, there is no one technique that's going to find everyone. You don't need to hire a consultant. You can do this on your own. The, the additional comment that I would make is that um, we did many of the same things that Troy did. Um, and in addition to our staff, we um, utilized our planning commission and sent our planning commissioners out to do the same thing, to have the coffee talks and to, to meet with their neighbors and to uh, uh, call up folks and, and do phone interviews. So, um, and that, that had the added advantage of um, getting the planning commissioners directly involved in the process, as well as building uh, kind of a, a credibility for the process, because um, it's one thing if, you know, if, if a staff member shows up and, you know, we're, we're pretty low on the respect poll in the community, but if, uh, if a planning commissioner shows up and, it, and he's, you know, they're your neighbor and your friend and you know who they are, that comes up with a little bit more credibility. I'm sure you have plenty of street cred down there in Springdale, Dom. Um, so I know that this was really short. Um, 
opportunity to inter interact with with these these two uh, stages of, of how to how to refocus a community. Um, but again, this is just the start of a conversation. So um, moving forward, it's uh, it's it, we're going to transition to what we call a peer to peer learning event. Um, for those of you who who have never done that before, it's an opportunity for you as audience members to have conversations together about this content, about things that are working or not in your communities. Um, Troy is going to be able to stay around and join that. Um, Tom, unfortunately, has a, another, probably another important meeting to run to. Um, so thank you, Troy and Tom. We really appreciate your insights and wisdom. Um, and, and like I say, that hopefully this starts a conversation that, that doesn't end here. Um, so Liz put in the chat the registration link. Um, feel free to jump over and, and join us here in our our peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. And then moving forward, um, as it was mentioned, this is the, the first in a series of these webinars. Uh, the next one will be talking about the idea of reframing. Um, a lot of communities are, are rich in natural assets, but maybe don't see the forest through the trees. So it's this idea of focusing on the assets that we already have rather than the deficits or the problems that we're facing. Um, so the idea is we're, we're hoping to reframe challenges into what we're, we're here that in our initiative are calling opportunities and, and find existing resources to support those. Um, so finally, the last thing that I like my last ask before you leave, when you do leave this webinar session, a little um, request for a survey will pop up. Please consider taking it. It helps us understand um, who we're helping as well as how we can continue to grow the series, what we can do better, and what we can improve on. So it should, I think it's just a handful of questions. It should only take a few minutes. Um, so with that, I'm going to close our time here on the webinar. Thank you so much for being part of what we're, what we're doing here at the NAR Initiative. And if you're interested and you want to continue this conversation, the peer-to-peer -peer session will be going from 12.45 to 1.30. So we're immediately going to jump right into that and, uh, and continue this conversation. So with that, We'll see you here in a few seconds in the peer-to-peer -peer session.